And actually, I've got um, some bubbles. It is water because I'm planning on going to the gym later. But um, I, I thought I'd celebrate anyway. So cheers, Rob. Happy 500 episodes. Cool. So, um, so first of all, we're going to do a very quick um, little bit of five lessons that we've learned from putting out 500 episodes of the Property Podcast over the last nearly 10 years. We're then going to take your questions and we're going to take it in two different, um, two different forms. Um, so we're going to start with questions about the podcast and anything you might be curious about there. And then we'll broaden out and talk about questions about the property market in general. Da, da, da. Rob, five lessons from 500 episodes. So, oh, look at that. So um, the, first, the first lesson for me is don't go alone, whatever you do. Um, whatever you, with the podcast, I, I don't think it's any coincidence that we both had our own podcasts and we've had them sporadically in the early years and they didn't last and they didn't last because it relied on us and our motivation and everything to turn up but the property podcast has because we're accountable to each other and so we have to turn up every time or it's a bit awkward and I so that is what has made, meant that we haven't missed a single week and I'm sure Rob you could apply this to so many other areas of life and property as well. Uh, accountability it's it's a bit of a recent one for me because Yes, we've kept each other accountable in the pod or on the pod, but it's kind of without realizing. And then I realized in, in business as well, like us being co-founders for the businesses that we have together. Again, that accountability to not let the other one down, I think has definitely pushed us to do our best in, in business. But then you started applying it in, in fitness as well. And then I copied you with, like with most things. So I, um, I applied it with business. I mean, recently, just as an example, I've um, got a Peloton bike, and I kind of gone off the, the off the wagon with it. I hadn't used it in ages, so I started a accountability challenge with another Rob in our business, Rob Wiggins, and we said, right, let's see how many days in a row we can go, like streaking, and who goes the longest wins. And whoever loses buys the other lunch. So like true accountability, and you know we're multiple days in now, and and some days I've not wanted to do it, and there's no way I would have done that peloton ride if i didn't have that accountability on the other side and there's no way we would have done 500 episodes without missing a single week if we weren't co-hosting together i know you've said the same so it's not just that me and i'm not disciplined there's always something that you could do but you just don't want to let anyone else down and i think you can do this in property as well massively yeah if we, whether it's working with an official partner in what you do or just getting a friend who cares about what who cares about you to hold you to account the power of that has been such a driving factor in getting us this far number two rob keep it consistent and i think turning up and doing something literally every week has been a big played a big part in growing the podcast as big as it has People love consistency. Consistency is good for you in terms of actually showing up and doing it, but everyone loves consistency. And so the fact that you can rely on the podcast to come out every single Thursday, whatever's going on, whether it's Christmas Day, New Year's Day, whatever it is, we've been through that the birth of multiple children have, have happened while the podcast has been going on and we haven't missed one. That counts for something because it come, becomes a fixture that people can rely on. Consistency, just that it's that if you can do a little bit, Every, whether it's every day every week every month if you just make progress towards your goals every, consistently you're going to be so further ahead you know with property it could be just that you are committed to educating yourself you know listening to the podcast um it's a great way of being consistent with your education there you can play it in so many ways but it's been a massive massive driver for our success and yeah consistency definitely deserves to be one of our key takeaways um number three just get started this is another big one and like when we when we started the podcast we we, we were we loved podcasts we loved the idea of it but we, we didn't really know what we were doing we weren't the experts in podcasting we weren't massively the experts in property i mean we knew a fair bit because we'd been in it for a while when we started but we know so much more now there's another actually point on that coming up but the point is we didn't wait until we felt that the time was perfect to get started and um, this i think rob hugely applies to property because there's always a reason not to do it now and we've seen this consistently in terms of whether it, in terms of news flow, in terms of your personal situation. There's always a reason why now is not the right time and you should wait and see. 
And there will be people who've listened to the podcast, I know there are, who've been listening for all these years and still haven't quite brought themselves to get started. And maybe if they got started, they would have made a mistake and it wouldn't have been perfect. But they, they would have learned so much that they would have been further ahead anyway. Uh, the getting started point is huge. So it's easy to go, well, yeah, but you, you know, you've got, you got the big podcast and it's nearly 400,000 downloads every month, which is bonkers. Thank you for being part of those downloads. But when we started, it probably wasn't even 400. Like it was, it would have been tiny, right? Because we did a bit of promotion, but we didn't have an audience and we just started. We started with property investment. We started a business and it's the same for, for everybody watching or listening. It's just start, just if it's property, if you haven't begun investing yet, just start. Now, if you have the money to invest, then today, this afternoon or over the weekend, don't make excuses, set the time, do it and book in, book in that time and go and do the viewings and start, that's starting to make progress. L listening to podcasts is not enough. You have to take that action. This could be called take action, but just doing something. If you haven't got the funds to invest yet, then it's like, okay, well, what can I do education-wise? How can I level up? And the fact you listen to the podcast is encouraging, but what else could you do? Have you been to a networking meeting yet? Have you engaged with other property investors in real life? Kind of scary thing, right? But that's going to level you up. Just start doing it. Everything new always seems scary, but most things aren't. Once you've done it, you kind of think, why was I like, worried about that? Why was I bothered? But when you do it, then you kind of go, okay, let's, great, what's next? And you get that momentum. But starting is so, so important. Um, number four out of our five points, if you're just joining us, these are five things that we've learned from doing 500 episodes of the podcast and how you can apply them to your investing in your life as well. So number four is to become an expert, create. So I was saying earlier, when we started, we knew a reasonable amount of property because we'd been investing ourselves and we'd been running property businesses for an amount of time, but we didn't know everything. We still don't know everything, but we know an amazing amount more than we did. Part of that is just because we've been in it for longer. We've now been in it for 10 years longer than we had been. So naturally you gain knowledge, but I'm convinced that what the, what's really driven our knowledge accumulation has been having to turn up and explain it to other people every week. When you have to put something out there and put a point across, whether it's to persuade someone, inform someone, entertain someone, whatever it is, you learn so much more about what it is. You're forced to do the reading in advance. You're forced to think about what you want to do. And by putting together whatever the material is, whether it could be a, it could be a blog, a podcast, a YouTube video, anything at all by doing that you clarify your thoughts so much and because you're spending more time immersed in it and thinking about it you start to link up other concepts that otherwise you wouldn't and so it's the absolute best way for me Rob to learn anything is to just create and that naturally ties back into just getting started because it's so easy to get put off creation because you say oh well I don't know everything I'm not the expert well you you get there by creating by starting that's the whole point yeah, it can, it can sound intimidating. And, you know, you can put this to property and go, okay, you want to know, be more of an expert with property or anything in life. If you start creating on it, it'll make a difference. But it, yes, a podcast is doable. No one has to listen. If you just make the podcast, you'll, you'll learn. If you like writing, it could be a blog. It doesn't have to be a book. You don't have to go as extreme as Mr. D. You, but you could just start really small. If people don't engage, that's not the, the entire point. If we had a tenth of the listeners that we have to the podcast, we still would have the same knowledge as we have today because we presented that information. So yes, we've done a lot of doing. Yes, we've done a lot of investing. You know, we've done transactions worth hundreds of millions of pounds worth of deals. But the most knowledge, you know, has really come from nearly as much, if not more so, is by the creating part, by making us think about our experiences and what did we learn from them? Because you can do stuff. But actually, when you then document the stuff that you've done and talk about it, you learn so much more because you're, you're forced to think about it. So we're going to do our fifth point and then we're going to move on to questions. And we're going to be starting with questions that you have about the podcast itself. I've seen some really good ones coming in already. Keep them coming and we'll answer those in just a minute. After we've done our fifth point, I think, Rob, you should lead this off because I've done a few. Number five, don't settle. Do not settle. Let, so let's focus on the podcast to begin with. So we've never settled with the podcast. So a few years in, it was doing fantastically well. We had... Um, a basic editor and we thought right that's great but we didn't settle we 
hired a full time, well, nearly full time producer and editor, someone who works a, a lot with us, a, a lot puts a lot of hours into the podcast with us, and that's helped level it up again. And then this year, the, you know, the podcast is a top five business podcast, but we thought, no, let's level up, let's not settle. So we went through all our data and went, okay, let's look at what's working here. What have all been our most popular episodes? What do people want, basically? And let's do more of that. And we changed around the content the second half of this year. You may have noticed that we're kind of focused on these bigger themes. It's because that's what you want. That's what the, we get the most reaction to and the most downloads. And our podcast this year has lifted up 20%. So it was already a big number. Like, if you've got a portfolio and you're completely happy with it you don't have to keep expanding but maybe you just need to improve what you've done can you look at the mortgage products can you look at the rents that you're charging what can you what can you do don't just get blase about it all but maybe you've got your portfolio and you could push that a little bit further by not settling always means that you push in but in property hub and portfolio we've got a value called constant improvement and that really relates to this which is like we always can improve on everything we do and we apply that to most areas of our lives. Are we perfect? Far from it. This is not to be confused though with like grinding and just working 24 seven. It's not the same. So if we go back to the podcast example of, of changing the content around, that was a morning's thoughts and conversation and thinking about how we can improve things. And then a couple of days research. So two and a half days total of effort to lift our podcast by 20%. So it's not that we you know put in 50 60 70 80 hours weeks to make the podcast better we just gave it time but we didn't settle and then we we gave it some thoughts and and you know some intellect hopefully and then we thought okay this is how we can do it let's test it we tested it and it improved but not settling allows you to constantly improve and i think that's a good thing to do in life i think it's always good at least in one area of life to always be pushing yourself that's right. I think you're completely right to say that it's not the same as just working hard. Like we're we're not working twenty percent harder to grow our numbers by twenty percent. We're doing the same. If you took the approach of well, I just need to do more. I'll put out more podcasts, more content. Then that's one way of doing it. But that's not the best way. So the, our way is just kind of being, yeah, putting I suppose more thought and not being not just being set not being happy with satisfied with where we are but putting in thought to try to move it to the next level and i think as well as not you don't have to work ridiculously hard you don't have to optimize every area of your life all at once i think it makes sense to have kind of one goal at a time and be be optimizing one or maybe two different areas you can definitely fall into a trap of just trying to especially when you first get excited about personal like personal improvement trying to optimize everything all at once and that's a good way to burn out there we go. Those are the five things that we picked out that we've learned from 500 episodes of the Property Podcast. Hopefully we we'll did a bit more than five, but we don't want to keep going and going and going. With questions, let's start it off with um, general questions to begin with. So um, about the podcast, high level stuff, stuff that will be hopefully timeless stuff we can answer. And then of course, we'll get into the market today because people want to know about that. So We'll prioritize those questions that are coming again um, that really allow us to do timeless content, evergreen content as they like to call it. Rob, here's a good one. Um, did we ever feel any potential backlash from the fake guru community who charge for this type of learning and information? Um, I, no, no, there's been the odd little bit, um, but nothing too sinister. There's, yeah, there's been the odd little shots fired but nothing nothing aggressive nothing that's bothered us no there was um there was a a, a company or individual who we will not name who took out who was trying, trying to do seo like negative seo like against my name and 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 like and sort of make a certain insinuations and and sort of wrote me a very stroppy email at one point as well but i think they kind of got the message that we're just gonna we weren't that bothered like it's so the best thing to do is always just ignore it right and so we just kind of ignored it didn't get any attention didn't escalate it into some big beef and so it just kind of they kind of gave up before we go on like, i think i love the fact that people still don't know which of us is which it's like we addressed as like rob without the beard and <laughs> rob with the big microphone <laughs> we should we should probably have found a way of getting our names up on screen we'll do maybe we'll do that next time or should we just say who we are that could help oh could do that hi i'm rob d <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm Rob B. And you can see how good our editor is. Um, <laughs> he actually makes us sound half decent and, and occasionally smart. Um, and not like that. Um, <laughs> okay, next. Um, what other questions have we got? How do you think a newbie can get into property investment, Rob? That's a really tough question. Because um, it always has to it always has to come back to goals and what you're trying to achieve which would and that's always a start to any answer and it sometimes feels like a bit of a cop-out but it does because it's like well what are you trying to achieve and what have you got behind you in terms of are you a newbie but you've got a million quid or are you a newbie and you've got a thousand pounds they're very different things so i think the best the best thing that you can do for me i'd be interested in your answer is to to always always start getting experience as quickly as you can and so if that experience can be actually going and buying a property that's awesome if that experience if you can't do that but you can i don't know get exposure get a small amount of exposure through a fund so at least you're kind of you've got something in it you're, you're interested in what's happening and so that kind of causes you to go oh why has that happened then you kind of going learning if you can't do that or you don't want to do that then just be be a be absorbed in it all the time and keep keep on learning and trying to speak to people who are doing it yeah that would be the start of my answer Rob. i don't know if you've got anything to add no no i think i think that's a, a great answer it's just getting it comes back to one of the points and it's just getting started you know financially you're not maybe able to do it but go and work with another property investor shadow them see what they do ask questions just build on your knowledge and then con and consistently save as quickly as you can um, i've seen a great way to remember who we are rob um rob b the beard rob beard rob b there we go perfect i'll remember that from now on richard <laughs> um, richard has asked which subjects are most um are most popular on the podcast interestingly um i say there are two categories of things that are, that tend to get the best numbers and the most reactions um one is all the the macro stuff so anything that we do to do with inflation and qe and things like that even if it's not directly relevant related to property anything to do with the 18-year cycle obviously but also things that aren't actually to do with property um anything that we do around kind of general general self-improvement and mindset kind of topics we always get really good reactions to those which is and we're never quite sure whether we should be doing them because it's like well it's not really about property you can kind of relate it back but they always get they always do really well they do the podcast related why did we stop aob i suppose we've just been on a very long pause but the truth truth is we didn't really enjoy making it and i think that says something that you should try and do the things that you enjoy we really really enjoy creating the property podcast like really enjoy it obviously 500 episodes in aob was kind of felt like a chore i think it was because we possibly committed to do it on camera as well so we had to travel somewhere that was more effort um which i know it makes it sound like we're a bit lazy but we do have a lot of other things going on so it was kind of the lack of enjoyment then meant the motivation wasn't there so we didn't push on with it we do definitely like talking about business and we are and maybe let's make an exclusive rob we are very very tempted to release a new podcast in the future hopefully in the new year certainly in the first quarter of next year you feel free to guess we won't give it away what it's about yet um but we will go again with another podcast something that we think we're going to really enjoy recording and in a format that's going to suit us so yeah, and I think it's important that we're we're learning our lessons from from the last one and going. Okay, well, well, whether we enjoy it, that sounds like a selfish thing, but it's really important because that's how you that's how you do a good job and do some of those things we talked about earlier in terms of being obsessed with getting better and better. And we're sort of doing some try sort of trialing it in, in advance as well to try and nail it before we get started. Um, got an interesting, got a funny one from Ben. It says. Um, Rob B, meant Rob D, <laughs> oh, he's corrected himself. Um, I know you choose to rent. Does your landlord know who you are and do they listen to the podcast? I'd find it weird if I were your landlord. Um, I actually, I did, um, when I called up about the property we're renting, the letting agent um, recognized my voice, um, which is actually really helpful because there was a lot of competition for getting this property. So I don't know if I'm able to repeat that every time. Maybe it's a good motivation to grow the podcast to make sure I get recognized by everyone. But that was a bit, a bit of a win and I liked it because in real life, Rob B gets recognized far more than I do. 
So I take the wins where I can get them. I think it's just because I go out more. <laughs> um, who who's asked that? It's in the list. Do we? It's Kathy. Do we ever disagree? Because we seem to agree on most things. We do agree on most things, actually. I put it down to Rob's patience, probably more than anything. Uh, but I think that's important that we are aligned on kind of the kind of values and visions that we have for the podcast and the business. So we don't disagree very often. And when we do, it's just the respectful conversation because when we have a different point of view, which probably isn't often enough, we're both, we both get very cur curious to why the other person doesn't think that way. You know, when Rob doesn't agree with me, I really want to understand why because it's, it's you want to embarrass him, he's a super smart guy. So if he doesn't agree with my point of view, then I want to understand his point of view because at the very least, I'm going to probably learn something, improve my point of view, or change my point of view. So I know that sounds like we're like Switzerland, and we never argue. We've never got cross with each other, but we're not. We're not that. It's just that's not what we're like. I know. It'd be more interesting for the podcast if we disagreed more. Sometimes like, you might have heard us say, "Oh, I really want to disagree with you on that, but I can't." Um, but I think. Yeah, we're, it's always in, more interesting than we do because it's an opportunity to learn. But it was, I think we we're quite similar anyway. That's why we work together well. But also when you work with someone for a long time, you sort of start merging a little bit. And it's it's kind of the same in a marriage. Like people kind of get more get more similar over time. And you know, in terms of investment strategy, my part of my strategy moving has been influenced by by Rob and sort of seeing what he's doing. I, oh yeah, I see why he's doing and why he's doing it. And yeah, he's right to be doing that. So I, that's why I sort of shifted. And so we've become more similar over time in different ways. Happy to move on to property questions. So if you've asked. As a property question and we've missed it feel free to ask again because the chat flies by we don't get to see it all but let's have a look Har it's an interesting question from harry given the interest rate for the next year would you look at capital growth over rental yields i all i always look at both but the one i'm optimizing for is capital growth because capital growth is where you get the wealth I mean, rent is the nice bonus top up your rental profit the capital growth is where the meaningful wealth is created. And that's where I've, not at the beginning, so I've adjusted my strategy, but certainly over the last few years, I've optimized my personal strategy to take on property investments that hopefully will deliver the most capital growth. And the way to look for those properties is looking for areas that show a lot of value. So often it can be decent rental yields plus very strong fundamentals. So if you find an area that has you know quite attractive yields, doesn't have to be like barnstorming, just quite good compared to other places with good fundamentals, like really good fundamentals, then you can go, oh actually this place has you know got a great opportunity for capital growth. So areas that we've identified in the past that qualify for that would be Manchester. Certainly throw a Derby, Liverpool, Nottingham into that batch of places that have incredible fundamentals. But actually um yields are pretty decent and and normally when you have decent yields and really really strong fundamentals the next step is capital growth uh james has asked a question about renting versus owning we'll answer that one in a bit but i've got um another one from richard he says is now the wrong time to buy should we be waiting for a few months and the likely crash to happen this is this is a difficult one. I've actually got a video coming out on a very similar subject next week, so watch out for that one. But the, obviously, you could look at the situation right now and go, yeah, of course. Um, clearly, there are lots of reasons why everything could go wrong, and therefore, I'll wait and see what happens. The only problem with that is that you could have made the argument at multiple different points over the last however many years. So you could have done that with COVID, you could have done it with Brexit. You could have done it when there was the um, the election with um, Jeremy Corbyn. And there, there are so many reasons that you go, oh, well, some, something's going to go wrong soon. Therefore, I'm going to wait and see. And there's never a point where everything looks absolutely brilliant forever into the future. Um, and the problem is, actually, that if there ever is a point when everyone is feeling great about everything, that means something's probably going to go wrong soon. Like <laughs> it's the best time to invest is generally when people are nervous. You can get out there and good, good do good deals. People are thinking the world's going to end, but actually it doesn't. Obviously, the thing is, at some point, 
things are going to go really wrong. We've talked about that extensively. You know it's going to happen. So it's just a matter of, well, is it going to be now or is it not? And we can't tell you what to do, what you should do, or what you should think. All we can do is give our view of things and tell you about what we're doing personally as well, which we did on the podcast just yesterday. We're talking about how we're buying at the moment. So that's all we can do. And then you have to make up your own mind. There's a really good question from Jamie because it, allow, it allows us to answer two things, actually, which is, when the crash comes, how deep do we think it'll be? Will it be, you know, a deep, severe crash, or will it be, you know, a quick recovery? And I think it allows us to say when we think a crash will come, which I think we're again <laughs> in unison when we say that it's a good few years away yet because there's still the boom to happen, and how big the crash will be will, will be to be determined by how big the boom is, and that's nearly always the case. If you have a super strong aggressive boom, then you tend to have a super strong aggressive crash. It kind of makes sense, right? So time will tell. Anybody who's going to start predicting on how deep or shallow the next crash will be doesn't have a clue. None of us do. It's going to depend on how big this boom ends up being. And the government, I, I think, wants a boom. I, I think that's what they try to start with the recent budget. Let's not go into that in too much detail um it may have not worked so far but that's their intent you know stamp duty the change is there what does that suggest well that suggests that they want a very strong property market even though it's up uh, it depends on which data set you use but at least eight percent so far this year so the pro property market's done incredibly well this year it's softened a little bit didn't crash didn't drop just softened and the government went in straight with a stamp duty cut I think that tells you everything you need to know about what they want to happen to property prices over the coming years. And if that happens, and if we go into a boom, an aggressive boom, then unfortunately we'll have an aggressive ca crash. And if we have a modest boom, we'll have a modest crash. So I'm not one for big boom and busts, um, <laughs> a bit like Gordon Brown. Um, but unlike Gordon Brown, I don't think it's the end of boom and busts. I, I think that there are more to come and will always come because of human nature. So there's quite a lot of different questions around mortgages and sort of, I suppose if I bucketed them, it would sort of be like um, mortgages are getting more expensive. Does that mean property values have to come down? And what should I be doing with mortgages given where rates are? So I think if we, there's a few different things to say about this. We talked about this bit on a webinar that we did last night and we'll probably end up doing something on the podcast about it soon. But the important thing at the moment is at the moment, Mortgage rates are all over the place at the moment because no one knows what's going to happen. So expectations of future interest rates have changed changed really rapidly after the mini budget. And as a result, nobody's got a lot of visibility. Lenders need to know what's going to be happening over the coming years for their fixed rate products. Um, and they don't. So they pulled all their products. They're in the process of bringing them back. And where they come back, nobody really knows. But what's going to be important is where the, the base rate ends up settling so there's lots of predictions around this like there's there's predictions about it being six percent by the middle of next year maybe but nobody knows nobody has a clue Every, everyone who tries to predict these things ends up being wrong i've been wrong about the base rate the important thing to know for now is that at the moment we're just in a bit of a i'd say a bit of a pause where we just don't know where rates are going to settle they're very clearly going to settle higher than they have been in the past rates have been close to well the base rate has been close to zero for years mortgage rates have been extremely cheap for years so they were only ever going to go in one direction and i don't think they're going to come back down to where they were before we're just in a different era now but i it's a case of where they settle and are we suddenly going to see runaway interest rates i don't think we are um but i think at the in terms of what you should do at the moment like should you be should you be doing anything right now should you be fixing we've said on the podcast recently if you can the best thing to do now is nothing um and in terms of just wait to see where things settle settle down and in terms of how, how long should you be fixing for i can see the argument for doing a long-term fix but there if you're doing it right now you it's possibly possibly a bad time to be doing that because you're locking in a pretty 
a pretty unkind rate when there are lots of factors pointing to the fact that actually it's going to get better over the next couple of years. So I've previously said like I'd fix for five years, slightly tongue in cheek because it means I can't be bothered to deal with it after two years. But my view has changed over the last couple of weeks because of everything that's been going on. And I now think that it's probably best to maintain some flexibility because yes there is a risk that rates will go up further but i'd say on balance it's more likely that the the situation right now will settle down and they will come down from where they are now not down to where they were but down from what's available right now it's a good question in from craig he's got 80k to invest and how should he get started so once you've established your goals and your strategy for me it's don't overthink it it comes back to one of our points earlier in this podcast, which was get started. Your first investment, you will probably regret or critique more than any other in years to come. Because you'll look at it and go, oh, well, that's not right. You know, I had this idea of a goal on a strategy, but it's adapted and changed. And actually, it wasn't the best pick. Don't worry about that. Like By starting, you're progressing because you'll learn those lessons and you'll become more informed as an investor by the doing the great thing about property investment is in the vast majority of cases you know unless it's a nightmare situation in the vast majority of cases you get rewarded anyway you might not get as much capital growth and you might not get as much rental profit but you still over time should get both and that's you know in terms of learning that's the best type of learning right you still get rewarded over the long term Mitesh has asked do you think i've lost the question now uh, do you think the rental market will ease off as house prices fall um i don't think the rental market will ease off because if we're talking about house prices falling for a start we don't no one has any idea what's going to happen with house prices if we do see if, if we do see falls from where we are now which is entirely possible then i think Base, we've talked about the 18 year cycle we did our most recent episode on where are we in the cycle all that still applies the any falls that we get from here are going to be pretty minor and even if you got a fall that was pretty major it doesn't mean everyone's suddenly going to become a homeowner and be doing that instead of renting because the thing is whenever you do get a big crash whenever that does come it becomes a really difficult time to actually buy because it's really hard to get mortgages any kind of change in terms of the balance of owners and renters is going to take a long time to happen it's not going to happen suddenly i think with so many questions around the market what to do that video that you created recently is going to be a big help to everyone so we're going to wrap up soon so i highly recommend everyone checks out that video next after about seven eight more minutes you'll be well informed my next question i'll pick up is around diversification i've seen a couple of questions on this on how do we how do you diversify in property and how do we diversify it with our investments so in property, one way, there are a few ways to diversify. So one way to diversify is doing different strategies. I personally don't like that because it's more work. Because you may be invested in property, but they are so, so different and require different energy, effort, and it's actually very little duplication. Other than them being both property investment strategies, there's very little different. Uh, so there's very little in common which helps you. So for example, if you do professional buy to let, it's kind of more set and forget. If you did that also with holiday lets, which is quite intensive, they are very different things. It's a way of diversification within property, but it's not one that I personally would choose. The way Rob and I both diversify is to choose different locations and different property types. So we both have a mix of houses and apartments. And we both have a mixture of areas that we invest in as well. So if a particular area does well, then we benefit from that but that also compensates for an area that is underperforming. Now, when you start, I appreciate that is, you know, really difficult. And, um, you know, that's why, you know, you put all your eggs in one basket and you kind of feel under pressure to get it right. But as I've already said, just starting is better than, than doing nothing. And, and you'll learn those lessons. And it doesn't have to be the best investment ever. Diversifying wealth and investment in general. I, I, I know it's pretty similar for you, Rob, but our our kind of diversification is poor because the amount of money you need to put into property is vast in, in most cases so because of that you become imbalanced with where your 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 wealth is put is located allocated it and th then it's probably a lot of ifas would look at it and go oh you know i don't like that your balance your mix there but 
we are investing in something that we are probably experts at and know very, very well. And I'd rather invest in something I'm an expert at than invest in something that I kind of have a, a passing knowledge of. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for diversification, uh, but the 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 the, type, the typical advice that you get is sort of for if you want typical results and so maybe you don't want typical results if you want to do better than that and you feel like you've got an edge in something or you've got knowledge of something then it makes sense to be imbalanced while while being aware of course of the the risk you're taking and not being unaware of that but what what one of the great things about property is that the we, we invest for the long term right so capital values could bounce around all over the place but rentals the rental income is always going to be there and so that that certainly helps because what what the portfolio is worth today is of no consequence whatsoever maybe in 30 years time it will be but today it's not thank you so much for joining us we didn't know if this is really be like crickets or whatever like it's inconvenient for people to join us so thank you for taking your your time out to join us today and helping us celebrate episode 500.